And I would like to welcome um, Robert, Robert Haas from IBM. Good morning. Good morning. It's very, very good to, to have you here today because you're talking about a very interesting and relevant topic. Um, you're, you will be talking about open standards and open sources at IBM. Uh, something I'm, I'm talking myself about, not, not specifically about IBM, but another company from time to time. And I'm really, really looking forward um, to your talk because um, like you have very, um, a very broad experience at IBM. Um, you're uh, now 24 years um, with IBM in various positions. Um, from storage to um, like newer technologies such as cloud and AI technologies. And um, I think you will be covering yeah, also quite a lot of, um, of, of, of topics today in your talk and I'm really looking forward to that. So that should be with the introduction. I'm really looking forward. Robert, the stage is yours. I will mute myself and we will see us back at the um, Q&A at the end. Thank you very much, Marcus. And if you can let me share my screen. Yes, here, very good. I'm going to do this right away. Uh, then we can get uh, started. So uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to present to you maybe a slightly different perspective on open standard and open source because of my background and, and my role today as a department head uh, at the IBM Zurich Research Lab here based in Zurich. And you can see that on the figure, on the picture on my screen. Now, these open standards and open source have played and do continue to play a tremendous role uh, in the world, an increasing role in Europe in particular, uh, and of course at IBM as well. So I wanted to share with you um, our perspectives on this, starting with what has been the impact, uh, long-lasting impact from IBM in open source, but then really come to some uh, recommendations, our observations uh, over the years, the many, many years, 20 plus years of participating in the open source, open standard ecosystem uh, of what is important, whether you are a user or a participant in these communities. And I will start with a topic related to AI. I was giving yesterday a guest lecture to the executive MBA uh, class of the uh, University of St. Gallen uh, about artificial intelligence. And they, they asked me often, like, oh, I mean, what is it that needs to be done in order to improve the adoption or ensure the adoption of artificial intelligence? I believe that open source has a great role to play here uh, with respect to trust and transparency that is really critical in this space. And I, I'll give you some examples, again, of open source activities that we do as IBM Research uh, to illustrate how we can actually improve this adoption uh, of AI. Then I will jump to essentially observations that we've collected over the years uh, throughout our community of experts at IBM and now Red Hat also, as to what makes an open source community successful and dependable and what to watch for when you're embracing open source, whether it's as a user, as I said, or as a contributor. And then to finish, I would like to also like open the horizon as to what kind of new uh, activities we are engaging on, research activities, uh, where we depend on the open source communities to really increase create the snowball effect behind uh, the work that we are doing in our labs in collaboration with uh, people inside and outside uh, the company. Now, just to set the stage, I'm responsible for one of the uh, technical research departments uh, in Zurich with about 100 researchers. In total, we have 3,000 in the uh, overall IBM research organization. We are across the world in 19 locations, right? And yeah, we are very proud of the number of uh, recognitions that we have received over the years. But sometimes the recognition of our participation, our influence in, in open source communities is not as obvious as you can see uh, compared with this type of awards. However, we are very active. Just in my own organization, I have a number of people, uh, some very senior developers, researchers, who have contributed, who are contributing 
into the Linux kernel, who are driving Apache incubator projects, as well as participating actively in developing open source uh, projects such as Foundation DB that are being used as core components within the IBM cloud offerings themselves. So we do work with open source day in, day out, uh, I might even say. Now, just to recap, it has been 20 years since uh, the Apache Software Foundation, uh, the Apache Software Foundation was founded, right? Uh, a little less since uh, the Eclipse Foundation was founded, and all these are are thriving organization, right? They are they're still there. There's still a lot of activity around there, and there are many more where we as IBM are engaging a lot. Kubernetes, Docker, just to to cite a few. Uh, the Hyperledger Fabric, another activity that is part of the Linux Foundation, where my colleagues, in particular here also in the Zerk Research Lab, are contributing ways to essentially make blockchain relevant for enterprises. So, something big happened last year. IBM worked for many, many years with Red Hat, but we, we sort of now got married, right? Uh, the, the companies now form one single company, Right, you know Red Hat. I mean, the pioneer of enterprise uh, Linux and and open platforms. The Red Hat uh, Rel uh, edition is is very famous. is adopted across the industry. Right, ninety percent of the Fortune 500 companies are using that. It's also known for its work on the container uh, side with OpenShift uh, technology. It's actually quite proud because we had the first customers of OpenShift in Switzerland. That was quite many years ago already. Right, so. It just reinforces our commitment as a company and, and, and reshaping even our culture continuously according to the open source uh, way of doing things. Uh, just to say, I mean, one a little bit of piece of advertisement here. The uh, CEO of uh, Red Hat, Jim Whitehurst, who is now the president of IBM, by the way, has captured his experience to apply the open principles to an organization. Right, so transparency, participation of people, community. So how do you reinvent your organization for the fast-paced, connect connected era? And how do you harness the talents both inside and outside your organization? And how you empower people to act with accountability at all levels? So a, a, a good uh, reading um, if you if you interested to understand more how this is actually infusing our entire organization as well. All right, so I was talking about AI in the introduction, right? And the, the need to go and, and explain and trust AI so that you can really derive the economic value of AI, start to bring it into your organization, into your businesses, into your institutions. Uh, and, and we know this results in measurable economic value. And open source is a key part in order to achieve this achieve this adoption, achieve this acceptance, right? So we, we need this, we need the open source, so people can, can do all these things, share, advance, gain visibility in AI that is in, done in a secure and fair way, right? So we believe open source is critical. I'm gonna give you three illustrations of what we have done as IBM Research in order to promote this. So there are many aspects that one has to look at. One of them is fairness. How do you ensure when you have an AI-based system that is actually acting in a fair fashion, that there is no bias, that the profile of a user upon which a certain credit scoring uh, algorithm will be applied uh, is not going to go and influence uh, that in an unfair manner? So there are many ways to do this. We have made available as open source a set of tools that one can go and use to measure if there are biases in the models that one could be using in, in these occasions. So fairness is one aspect. It's not the only one, right? The another aspect has to do with explainability. So AI models have been known to be kind of like black box. Right, you you get an outcome. You get maybe the recognition that this is a cat or or something else, but you, you cannot really explain 
how this has happened, right? However, we need to find ways to make this possible still. So lots of work, lots of research has taken place since the times when AI models were black boxes, and we have started to open these black boxes to kind of bring some understanding of what is really happening, to be able to evaluate how these models are, are performing so that one can, in the end, whether it's for from legal perspective or customer satisfaction perspective and so on, explain what why is the outcome the way it is based on this kind of input, based on this kind of training data. So another contributions that we made that is also available as open source for, for people to, uh, to use uh, an experiment. The last point, I talked about this explainability, but the security of your AI is also critical, right? What makes uh, you really be confident that there is nobody who is exploiting through the diverse means? There's so many ways that one can start to bring bias into a model, right? To start to actually fool you, influence your results in a way that you may not be willing to do so. Again, ways to test this, to test whether your, your models are robust, and then in real time to monitor whether there is no attack that is taking place on your AI. So all of this, just to kind of close the picture on the AI side, is important, we believe, and, and, and quite a lot more. They couldn't cover all the activities that are going on here, in particular at IBM, but also elsewhere, that we, we see reinforce the adoption of this technology uh, in businesses in particular. So after this, I wanted to start looking at well, open source, inclusive communities, and open governance. So open source is, is not always truly open, right? Uh, clearly, there are open source projects that may be run by a single individual or controlled by a single vendor, and they are quite closed in their governance, right? You could have other projects where uh, outside contributions are welcome, but the outside contributors, outside contributors are not given the opportunity to have leadership roles to set the technical strategy of these projects. So this is this can happen. And we believe with the experience we have gathered over many years and all these activities I mentioned initially that we have contributed to or even founded, that open governance is a keystone is in making sure that you'll you'll get the best opportunity to grow. Uh, in this in these open source activities. So what does it lead to as a, as a user or as a contributor to an open source activity? What does it what is lead to? What is the benefit for you when there is such open governance? First of all is it reduces the risk of project abandonment. If it is controlled by a single vendor or single individual, there is always this chance is a lot higher. We've seen that in the past. The second thing is eliminate single vendor control, right? It ensures that interests from many, from others are also included in making this happen. We know that it is always hard to let the baby go, especially for the vendor who may have started the original open source activity. But we have seen that it's very often the original vendor that gets the strong, becomes the strongest candidate to lead also in the collaboratively developed project, right? There was a, a study done about 10 years ago by a, an open source database developer in Finland. And the conclusions were that when you do this, when you go to an open governance model versus a single vendor control model, the projects grow 10 times faster. They go 10 times larger. So you have 10 times more investment into the development of your activity. So a larger community, Right? Larger community also means you, you increase the size of your addressable market. And often the, the original vendor gets to capture quite a large share of that larger market. So it's in the interest of everybody. Right? This, is, this is what I wanted to say here. And finally, it is a safe place to innovate for everyone to make sure that their contributions can be recognized and used and, and not um, depending on the opinion of a single individual or a single vendor to decide whether or not to include those. Now, going a little bit further, in terms of embracing open source, so now what should you, what should we be looking for? 
the key criteria, so this is five criteria that really stand out. I want to just summarize this briefly with you. First of all, is the licensing. What kind of licenses are being applied to that open source technology? There are a number of them available, right? One has to be very careful as which ones are there. Do they really enable every participant to go and take advantage of this technology also on a commercial uh, fashion uh, at some point? The second point is, is the commit process accessible, right? Is there a clearly defined process so that also outside contributors are welcome to make their contributions in there? Is the ecosystem diverse, right? Are there multiple vendors, multiple ISVs, uh, independent software vendors that are delivering offerings based on this open source technology? And finally, is the community a participative community, right? Is there a process so that the contributors can grow their technical eminence, not only commit, but also grow their technical eminence in that community. And finally, as I already said, the open governance is a point that we've seen is a critical one and that we've been always pushing as IBM when we participated, started to contribute, embrace open source activities. Now, all what I've said here applies to the uh, upper half of this uh, of this page, right? We try to use open source to democratize the industry. So provide these building blocks so people can start to build more sophisticated projects on top of these already established standards, right? Reducing redundancy, reducing the need to repeat and redo and reinvent the wheel again and again, right? It's like uh, when you want to go and, and take the train, you always have the train tracks that have been laid out for you. And all you need to do is uh, if you are inventing here, you can you can build a better train, but you can take advantage of these train tax. They are already there. They're already available for you. From a research perspective, in, in my role, right, we look at open source to help us accelerate science, right? It's really important, not only that researchers publish their papers, describe the methods that they have used to reach the results that they are so proud of, so that others can compare, repeat, validate, or in some instances, the opposite, right? And that helps make sure that we progress in our global understanding of the difficult problems we're trying to address, but that we really also take advantage of open source so that others don't have the burden of re-implementing software that we may have been using in creating the results that we publish in these papers, right? That is becoming increasingly important to accelerate the entire discovery process, make it more efficient. So for this, I wanted to take now, at this stage of the presentation, two examples, right? They are, they are maybe you are a little bit familiar with one of them, uh, maybe not, that is fine. Uh, one of them is to do with uh, quantum technology, quantum computers. The other one has to do with analog artificial intelligence. I will come, that, come to that in a moment. So if you recall many years ago, this is how computers looked like. Uh, well, they don't seem to look very different, but they are now exploiting very different principles, uh, physics principles, uh, quantum uh, principles of superposition and entanglements. And why is that important? Because it allows us to address problems that we were never able to address before, no matter what the size of the computers we would be able to deploy. Quantum computers have a fantastic ability through what they was called qubits to address things that so far we, we could only do with heuristics. We could only look at a small portion of the problem uh, because it was completely not addressable using standard technologies. So we have been progressing quite fast as IBM in developing quantum computers as, as a part of the ecosystem that exists out there where there are many who are actually looking at this as well. And we are quite proud that in this year, we were releasing a 65 qubit computer. Now, the more qubits you get, you exponentially increase the power of your computer. So this is quite important. I mean, when we reach at some point in time over 1,000 qubits and beyond that, 1 million qubits, we'll be able to address real business problem at a scale that has never been before. And this is not something that will happen in the very, very far future. You see this timeline. It's a very, very aggressive one, right? We've seen 
these uh, virus laws in, in IT, where we have an exponential increase uh, of speed, of density, and so on and so forth, it also applies here to quantum computers. Computers require a lot of effort to be built, right? We need to have gigantic fridges to keep the computers almost at zero Kelvin. So these efforts mean that not everybody is able to go and build a quantum computer, right? But we, as IBM, engage on this, made investments, significant investment to create those, and we make them available over the cloud. So anybody, you can actually freely go and start using one of our quantum computers. There are a number of them that we make available already today out there. But how do we now, based on this technology, start to create an ecosystem of solutions to address the specific problem that you may have in different sectors? We as IBM don't pretend we can go and do this just all by them ourselves. I mean, nobody can, right? This is such a big endeavor. So what we started doing is actually make this quantum development open source, right? You can go to qiskit.org. That's uh, the location where we make all this software available and contributors, over 300 contributors worldwide, not only at, at IBM alone, right, are participating to make that ecosystem a vibrant one. I'm going to give you some examples. So Qiskit is composed of a number of, uh, of components, right? I'm not going to go into the detail right now. It's open source. It's written in Python. It's modular and extendable. So it really meets all these criteria made for others to leverage and exploit and contribute back. Actually, we use plugins, we call them providers, so that you can run your Qiskit code, your, your quantum applications, and you can interface, connect to the IBM's uh, simulators or actual quantum computers that we make available through the cloud. But you can also go and connect your code through Qiskit to other, to partners or competitors' simulators or hardware. So there is no lock-in, right? We are really trying to make this a community-wide effort. We will strive to make our computers the best, the fastest, the most reliable. But we know we don't want to force users to only use ours. We want to make this open to competitors and partners as well. So because we took this approach, because we took this attitude, we have over 247,000 users. They have run a lot of what we call quantum circuits, these experiments that you can run on these quantum computers, 29 of them that are available out there. There's 130 clients and partners who are doing this, working on many applications, as I said, 300 contributors, and this is fueling the scientific output, not only from IBM, but from all those who participate in there, more, for, more than 400 scientific papers out there so far. So how is this uh, working? Well, we advance the technology, we enable the partners, our partners advance applications, and they guide IBM into directing how the technology also should evolve. So this is a win-win situation. Right? This is what you look for when you establish this type of open source ecosystem. Let me give you one example, which I find is quite telling of uh, what happened. I mean, one of my colleagues here in Zurich published a paper uh, on, uh, on what we call um, uh, amplitude uh, estimation uh, that is used to perform risk analysis. Then we had uh, in Japan at Keio University, some researchers, they took this work, they advanced it even further. Then uh, we had our partners at uh, JPMC in the US. They saw the work that Keio University presented at the Q Summit in 2019. And JPMC took it over. They started to apply this to options pricing. And, and later on, this work was uh, published by JPMC and IBM. And important pieces of this work were open sourced eventually into Qiskit with the support of all those people involved and now benefits and advances the entire quantum community. So these are the stories that are at the core of the mission of this IBM quantum network. Let me turn to another aspect. We talked about quantum, another technology, another computing, right? We are all sort of now 
uh, brainwashed by digital, everything looks digital, but the world of analog is still very present. And there are ways we can take advantage of this to make computers that take more inspirations of the way our own brain works. It's a analog machine we have here, right? Uh, and do this in a much more efficient fashion than you can do with traditional digital type of computing. We have at IBM created a chip, a chip, yes, that actually follows that model of analog in-memory computing, meaning that operations are taking in place without having to move data back and forth between memory and processor. And this is also what you expect is happening in our own brain. You don't uh, think that half of our brain contains the logic, the programs, and the other half of the brain contains the memory, the data. Everything is intertwined. Everything happens together. We created a chip that actually takes inspiration from that, takes inspiration from the structure of the brain, which is a, a, a network of neurons, right? So we create artificial neural networks, uh, but we do this in hardware. And we take more inspiration of the dynamics of the brain. We call this spiking neural networks to make it even more efficient. So as you see, over time, we, we use our brain as the model that we want to eventually come closer and closer to because we know we can be so efficient in terms of the energy we spend for the kind of work that we're able to to deliver. So what does it mean? We go away from the traditional digital computing that is based on the von Neumann paradigm that essentially acts as a bottleneck between memory and processor. We move computing, like maybe here, a deep neural network uh, computation into hardware. So things happen in place in each of these little devices in the chip I was showing to you before. Each of these devices actually is an is a piece of material, an analog computing device, as you can see here, that changes its resistance or the inverse of a conductance, uh, depending on how crystallized or amorphous this region of material is, which we can change dynamically and therefore perform a certain set of operations, multiplications, additions in place on that resistive memory device, right? Now, without going into more detail, what uh, we have observed essentially is same thing as the quantum uh, Qiskit uh, model. It is important when we come to the point that we realize there is such great potential for technology, we are creating the underlying hardware, but we need others to start to look into this and, and expand the, the knowledge, uh, accelerate the scientific discovery around this. So we just announced that maybe a month ago, right? We made available, again, as open source, what we call the Analog Hardware Acceleration Toolkit. So this toolkit has many things. It can simulate what I just presented, an analog in-memory computation. It can simulate a wide range of devices and different types of array configuration, crossbars, including the drift and some of the statistical noise that can happen in these devices that are analog, they're not digital anymore. So people can start to exploit this and see how you take advantage of it to, to run some uh, artificial intelligence tasks, deep neural networks, and so on and so forth. We make it excessively easy, uh, be it in the academic community or elsewhere, to actually hopefully build on the shoulders of giants, right? This is how we advanced uh, science. All right. I'm coming to, to, to the end of this presentation uh, before we go and, and jump to the Q&A uh, section. So, in summary, I've, I've showed you again what is the impact, the lasting impact, the, the broad impact of IBM in open source, even reinforced further uh, with our marriage with, uh, with Red Hat just last year. I emphasize how open source is vital for the adoption of AI to ensure trust and transparency. We looked at how the open governance model is critical. And in all the examples I've just gave you here, this is what we have in mind also, right? We walk the talk and we know this is how we make this, this project the most successful ones. I talked about the five criteria. We remember the licensing, the accessible commit process, the diverse ecosystem, the participative community, the open governance model that one should really watch for when you embrace open source. 
uh, be it as a user or as an active contributor. And then I, I wanted to illustrate these with two projects that come from research where we are here heavily involved also in Zurich on the quantum computing side and on the analog in-memory computing side. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this presentation and uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Marcus, back to you.